Okay, the next video, we're going to cover the 2.17 and 2.18 lessons to finish off Unit 2 in U.S. History. Okay, so looking at lesson 2.17, it's called the project. So this is just another day you have to work on your research project. It'll be a day where before you take the unit test, you can uh, devote to working on your research project. Or if you wish, you could finish the test for unit 2 and get that out of the way and then just swip, uh, switch your days around and work on the research project and the day that you should be taking your unit test. Um, just an idea that maybe you want to do that instead of um, while the I, information from unit 2 is still fresh in your mind. But this one here, it says you're supposed to submit your research project at the end of this uh, today's lesson. but. We gave you an extended deadline. Your U.S. history teachers gave you an extended deadline to March 20th. So that's when the research project and the annotated bibliography and the process paper will all do on March 20th. Then if we look ahead to lesson 2.18, the next one is preparing for unit test. So this is the review lesson before your test. Lesson resources, we just have the student guide. So no reading guides here, and we're completing online and offline review activities and a checkpoint at the end. So before you before begin your review of the turning points unit online by going through the following activities. Okay, so we have a couple online activities. First one is Roosevelt Taft or Wilson, and I do believe this is one we did in a prior lesson. So I'm not going to go through this one because I did do it in a prior lesson. It should be somewhat familiar to you as well as the reality of Versailles. Nope, that's not the one. Reality of Versailles. I believe this is one we did in a prior lesson as well. Yes, yeah, so where you had a paraphrase. So you can review that one. You can review flashcards. This one is something to do on your own. Um, you can shuffle the cards if you want to switch the review up. And it's just, you click on here, here's the question. What is the term for the U.S. practice of extending its power by taking over other lands or exercising, exercising political and economic control over them? To find the answer, flip it over. That's American imperialism. Go to the next card, you click there, and go through all the cards. If you want to re keep redoing them, just shuffle the cards up and um, continue on your review. Okay, when you're done with that, you can go on to the Unit 2 Review Activity. And we will go through this one. 15 questions. Which were arguments in support of American imperialism? New sources of raw material for U.S. goods? New markets to sell U.S. goods? American principles traditionally supported colonization. That's incorrect. Global military bases would protect markets for U.S. goods. Yes, that goes back to having the, a naval, um, naval bases to support um, the country. Influx of cheap labor. That wasn't something they were necessarily looking for as an argument for imperialism. So let's check our answers. Good job. Next. What killed the greatest number of American soldiers during the Spanish-American War? It was yellow fever, that deadly disease by mosquitoes. What were the outcomes of the Spanish-American War? Nicaragua and Panama did not become U.S. territories. Cuba did become independent. Puerto Rico did not become independent, but the Philippines and Puerto Rico did become U.S. territories. And the Treaty of Paris, if you recall, did end the Spanish-American War. So let's check our answers. Yes, we are correct. In 1903, the new Panamanian government sold the United States a 10-mile wide strip of land that led to President Roosevelt's greatest achievement. That achievement was the Panama Canal. One U.S. president used an extension to the Monroe Doctrine to justify intervention in Latin American affairs. What was that extension called? That would have been the Roosevelt Corollary. Which statement describes the start of World War I? Going along with the picture to hopefully jog your memories. The assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife Sophie set off a chain of events among European alliances that led to war. Remember, we had that strong system of alliances in Europe, the Triple Entente, the Triple Alliance. If one was attacked, the others would support them. And we are correct. Next, which were reasons for U.S. neutrality during the early years of World War I. The isolationist policies of the past still influenced American decision making. The United States cannot afford the cost of the war because of the recent purchases of land. That does not apply. 
large numbers of German immigrants were sympathetic to Germany. That was true. The American fleet was undersized following the Spanish-American War. That wasn't necessarily true. And many Americans supported the British but did not want war. That was true. Let's check if we are correct. And we are. Next, which event most clearly influenced the United States' decision to enter the war on the Allied side? Was it because Britain imposed an embargo on Germany? No, that wasn't really the United States' decision. Germany sunk the Lusitania, causing 120 American deaths. That's correct. Germany decided to end U-boat attacks on commercial ships. No, they started U-boat attacks. And Britain and France were a member of the Triple Entente. No, they were members of the Triple Alliance. So it looks like B is the only one that applies. Let's check. That is correct. What are your examples of expansion of the federal government during the war? The Food Administration to ration food to encourage people to switch their food habits. That was true. Banking Services Board, I don't recall that. The War Industry Board, which helped influence factory production, was definitely part of World War I federal government. The Railroad Administration to make sure goods were being shipped um, efficiently. That was something in Department of the Treasury. I don't believe that was part of the expansion of the federal government. Let's check our answers. Those all three of those, the Food Administration, the War Industry Board, and the Railroad Administration were all examples of expansion of the federal government during the war. Some of the effects of World War I on the United States. Reduction of the power of labor unions was one. There were new opportunities for women and blacks since the men were off fighting the war. Increased personal income? I don't know if that necessarily was a major effect. Resentment over government influence and control in individual lives. We did read about that. Growth and farmers influence? Not so much. Let's check our answers. Those were all the correct ones. What term describes the widespread fear that the Bolshevik Revolution and communism would spread to the United States? Uh, that's the Red Scare going to the Red Communist Flag. That's where we get the term Red Scare. That is correct. What are two ways that life changed for women in the 20s? Equal pay? No, there was no equal pay. Work opportunities and the right to vote? That sounds about right. Work opportunities and right to drink alcohol? No, that was prohibition, so they would, did not have that right. Right to drink alcohol and equal pay? No, neither one of those applied. So let's check if B was the one. And it was. Which statement most accurately describes the consequence of passing that 18th Amendment? <sighs> Women did not respond by voting in huge numbers. That wasn't because of the 18th Amendment. That had nothing to do with women's voting. Um, response. The consumption and possession of alcohol increased despite the new law. Um, I believe there was something that it actually did decrease some. Bootleggers gained wealth and organized crime increased. We know that did happen. Taxes increased to meet the cost of enforcing the law. That does not apply, so let's check. It was C. Prejudice against, prejudice against blacks, immigrants, Jews, and Catholics led to increased membership of what reactionary organization? Looking at the picture, that's the Ku Klux Klan. And lastly, what movement was an explosion of African-American cultural diversity? The Harlem Renaissance. Good job. And we get this word power. Make sure you copy it down or copy and paste. Exit out. And when you take your checkpoint, that was the unit two review. We you begin your checkpoint, enter the word you received when you completed the unit two review activity power and you submit your answer and you are good to go but going back to this lesson I believe there are some chapter highlights for us to look at American imperialism oh how many slides are there quite a few uh, I'll try to get through them I don't want to start another video just to read through the hi highlights but I'll try my best The late 1800s saw the closing of America's frontier and a new interest in a more international future. Imperialism promised raw materials and new markets, and some supporters used social Darwinism to justify new policies. The United States purchased Alaska from Russia and annexed Hawaii despite strong Hawaiian resistance. Yellow journalism increased American interest in Cuba's independence movements and eventually helped lead to the Spanish-American War.
The Spanish-American War ended Spanish rule in Cuba and brought the United States the new territories of Puerto Rico and the Philippines, even though Filipino rebels fought U.S. control. Anti-imperialist sentiment grew among those who saw imperialism as un-American, as well as among those who feared an influx of cheap labor and the potential for an increase in the non-white population. President McKinley stressed an open-door policy with China that was interrupted briefly by the Boxer Rebellion. McKinley's second term was cut short by his assassination. Vice President Theodore Roosevelt became the youngest president in the United States at 42. The Roosevelt Corollary to the Monroe Doctrine justified several Latin American interventions in the building of the Panama Canal. Theodore Roosevelt explained that his foreign policy as speak softly and carry a big stick and built the great white fleet to support it. William Howard Taft promoted dollar diplomacy backed up with troops, especially in Nicaragua. Woodrow Wilson took an idealistic approach to foreign policy, hoping to promote world peace and democracy. But interactions with Mexico, Haiti, and the Dominican Republic led to more U.S. Po policing of the Western Hemisphere. <coughs> By 1900, Europe faced an uneasy peace resulting from imperial expansion, military buildups, nationalism, and a system of alliances. Archduke Franz Ferdinand's assassination in the Balkans lit the powder keg of Europe and started the First World War. With a traditionally isolationist foreign policy, the United States declared neutrality at the start of the war. Germany's unrestricted submarine warfare and its overture to Mexico, as well as American economic and cultural interests, eventually drew the United States into the war on the side of the Allies. Congress passed a Selective Service Act, which called for a draft of military-aged men. Women and African Americans filled much of the labor shortage created by the mobilization of 4 million men. The First World War saw a dramatic expansion of the power of the federal government to regulate the economy and to influence private lives. The Committee on Public Information, CPI, sought to rally support for the war, but fostered prejudice and suspicion of everyone and everything not American. Congress passed the Espionage and Sedition Acts in an attempt to suppress dissent during the war. President Woodrow Wilson outlined his plan for a post-World War post-war world in the 14 points, which include the creation of what would become the League of Nations. The arrival of millions of American troops in Europe in the fall of 1918 broke the stalemate on the Western Front and the Allies drove American forces out of France. An armistice signed on November 11, 1918 ended hostilities between the Allied and Central Powers. The Treaty of Versailles punished Germany severely, resulting in the rise of militant nationalism in Germany. It also created several new countries and incorporated some of Wilson's 14 points, including the creation of the League of Nations. The U.S. Senate, unwilling to accept Wilson's worldview and Americans' role in it, failed to ratify the Treaty of Versailles, and the United States did not join the League of Nations. The progressive movement underwent a rapid decline as the United States entered a new era of political conservatism. The prosperity and economic growth. The 20s were an age of prosperity for most Americans as wages and GNP increased. So farmers and others experienced economic hardship and unemployment. The combination of Henry Ford's automobile assembly line and the country's widespread access to electrical power revolutionized manufacturing and household consumer goods became affordable or easy to buy on credit for the first time. As the urban population grew, tensions between urban and rural cultures increased. Americans in all parts of the nation shared a common culture with the advent of talking films, radio, magazines, and shopping by mail via catalog. Women gained new freedom through work outside the home, the right to vote, and the opportunity to experience prosperity. The modern woman was characterized by the flapper. Modernism, which favored individual experience, emotion, and personal freedom, dominated arts and literature. Nowhere was the artistic renaissance of the 20s more deeply felt than Harlem, where African American art, literature, and music blossomed. Negative reaction to the dramatic changes of the 20s included nativism, the Red Scare, the Scopes Trial, and the resurgence of the Ku Klux Klan. Passage of the 18th Amendment and the Volstead Act banned the sale of alcohol, which resulted in a reduction in consumption, but bootleggers and organized crime grew to meet the continuing demand. Republican presidents Harding and Coolidge emphatically supported big business. Herbert Hoover followed suit in America's hope for unending prosperity. Remember before you take the test for Unit 1, or excuse me, Unit 2, go through all your lesson review guides, the lesson answer keys, your reading guides and lesson answer keys, and try to attend the class connect session that we'll have for the Unit 2 review, or at least watch the recording so you can feel very prepared for the Unit 2 test. Good luck, everybody, and do a great job on your test.